Our featured guest is Natalia Bienueva Garcia, Managing Director and Founder of Vienna's Max Steiner Orchestra. Tell us about this love of Disney uh, movies. I completely fell in love with the magic that Walt Disney was. In university, I will realize what structures trigger that emotion. My family is a family of entrepreneurs. When did you decide that you wanted to go to study music in Vienna? Science saying Vienna. <laughs> Musical storytelling. Since the beginning of time, liturgical dramas, media composition. Through the combination makes something more than the sum of the parts. Men and women should do what they have always done. And I wrote that the, the economic system must change in order of the creative industry to develop. Cheers and thank you. Goodbye. See you next week. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by UR Music and Arts and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook live video feed, the link to which has been placed in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Our show is supported by your decision to give the gift of UR Music and Arts Christmas package this holiday season. Our 2020 Christmas package costs 40 euro or 47 US dollars plus shipping and can be purchased directly at www.urmusicandarts.com slash Christmas package. Tonight, our featured guests are Marina Lenick, a photographer who is finishing her professional studies at Université Lumière Lyon 2, and Natalia Mount, executive director and curator of Pro Arts Gallery and Commons in Oakland, California. Marina and Natalia are joined by Bob Vergara, an expert photographer with over 40 years of experience in all areas of commercial photography. Also joining us tonight are Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California and Professor Niels Moose, director of the Opera Masters Program at the Music and Arts University of the City of Vienna. Marina, welcome. Tell us a little Thank bit. You. Tell us about how you got into photography. Why did this become your life's passion? It became my life's passion. And I started uh, when I was around 14. And I guess as a lot of photographers, I started for, with, with pictures of animals, of landscapes. I learned to to, uh, to to use my uh, my camera and to to the, the settings and then I decided to go a little bit far from that and to create uh, a mood and uh, an ambience in my photos and then and yes I I had a kind of love at first sight with photography when I was 10 at school so let's take a look already let's see what this photography means to you today, what you, because just like you look through, we look through our eyes, you're looking through that camera and you're seeing something. So let's see what goes through your eye. So tell us a little bit about this, Marina. Yes, I've chosen this photo because uh, I got um, a long focal length at this moment and I learned to use it and it was very new to me because I learned to include the, the background in my photography and also to include yes the set the, the, the sets what's around the surroundings and I liked uh, the mix between landscapes and including a human in this picture and so as to telling a story let let the the audience uh, imagine something with this picture. Uh, what what this this is this woman looking at? Who is she waiting for, etc. Fantastic. So this uh, let's bring in Bob Vergara, please. Bob, what uh, do you make of this photo? And have you done similar photos? Uh, I have, but um, I, I I think this is a great photo. Um, you know, when you're shooting 
in the direction of the sun, which is how this is taken, uh, you know, that can often be distracting or, or create lens flare and things like that. But here, I think it's, it's used quite nicely. It, it, it's, the sunlight is minimized by its position to the building. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that the woman, you have to look closely to, to find her, but when you do, you know, it does evoke the, the, the emotions that Marina was talking about. That what is she looking for? Knight in shining armor to, to come and rescue her? Or, you know, just the, the entire thing. Uh, when it, uh, a photo can be this thought provoking and also aesthetically pleasing, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. it, it it's a great photo. Fantastic. Thank you. Let's go, go on to the next one. Yes, I've chosen this picture because it's very different from the, the past one. It's literally the opposite from the point of view. And here we clearly see the expression of the model. I tried to value also the makeup and here really the focus on her face, what she explains, what she expresses to us, what she's telling us and um, yeah, I really like this picture. I think it's one of my favorites. <laughs> so um, Marina, when you first sent us these photos and I shared them with Bob, he told me, you know her, she has her own style that she's developed, but that he would recommend that you do things that are not so people centered. And because on your Instagram site, it was all about people. Now I understand that this model is actually a very good friend of yours and you call her your muse. So actually people have a very, very important role in your idea of photography. Is that the case? Yes, I'm very inspiring about people and I'm very keen on why we can create with people. We can imagine a lot of um, uh, um, settings. We can be uh, thinking about accessories, about the surroundings, the backgrounds, the makeup, the clauses, we can create everything and we can control a lot of things that we can't do with um, landscapes photography or animals photography or we, we have a lot, a lot of possibilities. So Bob, I imagine you've been in the same situation before with models. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the definition of photography uh, is painting with light. So, you know, it, it is always, about the light. If there's no light, there's no photography. And, and the light here is what makes this photograph, uh, in my mind, um, you know, you, you see the close up of the eyes and there's just enough light on her left eye so that it's visible also. Uh, but just the, the smooth gradation of the lighting that goes by. And, and in terms of the, the makeup is great. The hand on the head, I think, helps to <laughs> create some sort of uh, uh, emotion here too, that uh, maybe this is not the happiest uh, <laughs> moment for this young woman, uh, maybe, but uh, just just great, shallow depth of field, used very well, and again, the lighting makes this photograph terrific. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I have a photo similar, and it, it, it really isn't similar, but um, the, the, the next photo, I think, up on the um, site would, would be a close up, you know, again, it's just how, you know, close ups are, are just, you know, a great way to, to convey emotion in a photograph. And um, this uh, young fellow here, he, he, it, it's, it's wild. He, he's a, um, a camera, first camera assistant. He's probably the best in the world at what he does. And, and you just get that sense in his eye that um, he's in charge of, of how things are seen. He's not the director of photography. He's the first camera assistant. So his job is, you know, technically the, the follow focus and the lenses that are used and, and how an image appears. So I was lucky to just turn the camera on him one day and, 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 and get this kind of shot from him. Similar, but not, not the same as what Marina had. Okay, let's go on. Marina? Yes, I've chosen this picture because you told me if it was one picture who definites your style, 
which would it be? And I've chosen this picture because it is colorful. And I think this is the definition of my work. I don't like flat follow colors. I like when it's vibrant, where is, there is contrast. And here it was just at the exit of the subway and it was totally improvised. And I like the fact that I say, okay, the shooting is, 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 uh, is finished, but I, I want us to create some, uh, just two or three photos because the sky was just beautiful. So let's uh, bring in Natalia Mount, curator uh, of the Pro Arts Gallery in Commons. Natalia, here we seem to get to the limit of, I should say, the frontier between commercial photography and art for art's sake. What do you make of this? And would this be uh, something that you would include in your gallery? Yeah, of course. I, I, I believe that the, the difference is what already Marina said, that she um, exited the subway and improvised and she just wanted to take the photo. So the difference between the professional versus the art, uh, the art photography in context is that um, we really can, uh, we can see the intention is different uh, for the artist um, when taking the picture, but also the agency for the artist is different. In other words, you know, um, you can become, uh, you, you're not as concerned as in a controlled setting about lighting and about um, the design of the picture and the setting, but you're more so interested in, in conveying and communicating a, um, a, uh, an emotional feeling through the composure of the image, which um, again, is up to the artist to decide how they would like to uh, present it. And again, that is the difference, the agency and the, the agency of the artist and the intention of the artist. That's how. Okay. Fantastic. So um, Bob, going back to you, we were talking about before, uh, we mentioned you brought up something very interesting yesterday about the color of a person's skin and we live in such a uh, strange world in which sometimes it's we should be colorblind other times we should not be colorblind it's not really sure but of course we are looking at a, a woman of african descent with dark skin and you're saying that they actually need to be treated differently in photography can you explain that a little bit to us uh, yeah yeah it, it's just you know um it, it, whatever the object is, you, you can't um, photograph a Caucasian individual with exactly the same lighting, whether it be outdoors, available light, or studio set up with strobes and things like that. You, you can't photograph a uh, Caucasian individual the same way as you would uh, African Americans. Um, I, I see it a lot that, that you know, um, the African Americans come up too dark, you know, that they're just, you know, underexposed a little bit. Um, when you have the opportunity to do it correctly, uh, I always feel that there should be uh, a base exposure for uh, African-American skin. And then you can apply the main or fill light as, as you see fit to make the situation dramatic or, or flat lighting. But, but there always has to be that base that, that brings up the, the faces and the details in, in the skin of African-American faces. So, you know, just something to think about when you see these photos on your own. And Marina, as you continue, you know, to, to something to keep in mind. Um, I, I think it's far more flattering when you see these people um, exposed correctly. So then uh, I'd like to bring up just a, a curiosity of mine because at the university today, it's very common to take courses in gender studies or in uh, gay studies, or in other words, that you are looking at perspectives of different of people with different identities. So Bob, have you spoken with African-American photographers? If you would be photographing uh, uh, somebody with black skin, would you go to somebody who's black? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, the conversations I've had uh, generally centered around portrait photographers and especially wedding photographers. Uh, it, it's like um, kind of a, a, a photographic challenge to have 
a bride all in white and gowned and you know that sort of thing standing next to an African American with somewhat dark skin and uh, you know to find that kind of uh, compromise exposure that that flatters both of them um, it, it, it's uh, it's something that you know as long as you're aware of it you you can control it to a degree so you know that that's really the most of my conversations have been with you know wedding photographers who, who run into this situation and, and family portraits as well you know so understood let's take a look at bob's photo actually now we have an example of bob's work yeah yeah all right the, the, this is just a copy of a, a photo that i i've done um you know i but it, it gets the point across um uh, joe is a haitian american and uh more or less dark-skinned individual. And, uh, you know, we, we did what we said we would. We, we, we filled in a basic exposure on his skin. And, and then we applied, you know, our uh, main and fill lights and, you know, gave his, uh, gave his face, a, 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 you know, something to look at. As, as opposed to the original, sit him down and take his picture, you know, it would have been much darker and, and not as, you know, revealing as, as, as to, you know, the texture of his skin and his mustache and all the rest of it. So, you know, just, uh, it's been kind of a pet peeve of mine for many years that it, it often doesn't um, show up the way it should. Fantastic. This might be a good time, Bob, to talk about your, um, how actually you should be dressed in black. <laughs> yes, I'm suffering the, uh, a uh, Zoom color shift again, uh, but I don't know what's going on, but uh, generally I wear black my whole life. <laughs> and uh, today that I'm being seen by more people than usual, uh, I'm in purple. But I, I assure you this shirt is black and, and photographers wear black so they can avoid um, uh, reflections. I mean, that's what I was always taught that even in the studio, you don't wanna be standing next to the, uh, refrigerator that you're photographing and and have you know reflections come through so um th that's kind of the way it is the, the other aspect of it is i think black is the uniform of photographers and uh, you, you generally want to uh look like a photographer um it sometimes helps you uh command the the the, the attention of the people or the group that you're you're photographing so uh yeah i apologize for the purple but um we tried to fix it and couldn't, and uh, the show must go on. We'll do it. Next photo, please. <laughs> okay. Marina? Yes, I've chosen this photo to have a link uh, to uh, with uh, professional photography because um, when I started photography, I said, no, I never do studio photo shoots because it's too boring and we cannot be creative. And then it was one month ago, it was, this shooting was my first, um, my first uh, photo shoot in studio. And I, uh, I'm sure now that uh, when we are professional, we have to um, get out of our comfort zone and, and learn different types of lights, learning with different settings. And it's very important to work differently that what we used to. Bob? Yeah, uh, th th this is, you know, something that uh, it, it is common in, in commercial and studio photography, photographing whatever the subject is uh, on a white background. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, the background may be silhouetted out and, and something else would be, would be added to it. But uh, it, you know, it's good that uh, Marina is, is, is you know, experimenting with this type of thing because, you know, it, it you may not do the work that you love to do every day. You know, you, you will occasionally have to photograph, you know, um, a can of soup or, or you know, a, a set of wrenches or something. You know, so doing studio photography and, and showing that you can do this and that you have been in the studio and you have a white background, you know, th those things uh, branching out diversity is great. Well, my comment here would be that uh, in, in this situation, there's a, a soft shadow on the background, and that can be avoided by simply moving the subject away from the background a little bit. And the way we do things like this in the studio is we would move the subject forward, we would light the background itself, 
maybe two umbrellas or something like that on the background. And then once the subject is away from the background, there are no more shadows and you can go ahead and light the subject any way you like. So, you know, that that's kind of the, uh, the way we have it done. There's a, a photo coming up next, I guess, that, that shows that sort of technique. Um, yeah, th this guy is on the floor, but um, the background is being lit separately and he's being lit in a flat, fashion to uh, to how the, uh, the the art director wanted it to look and um, you know there are no shadows so it, it's just common thing and and it's good that Marina is branching out fantastic so we have a question uh, or a comment from Doc, professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California Yes, um, it's a pleasure to meet you all, Marina uh, and Bob, and of course, Natalia. Um, my question uh, is with regards to, I, I have been in um, photo sessions with photographers for my professional um, photos, publicity photos. Uh, how do you um, tell the artist, for example, myself or your subject to pose? I have been told, okay, go like this. Okay, go like this. Okay, don't smile. Okay, now smile. Okay, now go like this. How do you capture the character of the subject that you are photographing in order to bring out the essence of that particular subject or artist? Marina? I think that um, it depends on the person we work with. There are some models, you don't have to say anything to them. They know it, they know what to do at the instant. And sometimes I had so cl some clients that they never post and that they were just lost. They told me, okay, what should I do with my hand? What should I do? And, and now I, uh, I take some pictures, some examples pictures and I show them and I say, okay, you can do this pose or this pose or this pose, or I show them, but I'm not very <laughs> talented in this. So that's why I show them pictures. I try to help them to relax. And it depends really about the model. The, of course, professionals are very relaxed in this and they know how to do it. It depends. Do you agree, Bob? Y yes, uh, you know, some people pose very naturally, uh, but most people do not. So I, I always find it helpful to uh, have some sort of conversation and, and contact with the individual ahead of time you know if it's a pianist or someone playing an instrument then you, you know obviously you want to focus on that aspect of it you know the hands and the, the face and all that but having a conversation with them talking to them a little bit getting them to relax and you know tell a joke or two beforehand it, it sometimes uh you know allows them to feel more at ease and and the the smiles or the expressions whatever they may be come more naturally if you get to know the person for five minutes before you, you take their picture. Um, but that's the best you can do, really. Some people, you go to pose them and they're like granite. <laughs> and they're just, it's impossible to get them to feel that look naturally. But okay. and, and also, you, 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 you may not have a very long period of time to deal with that, you know? So the, the attention span is, is very important. So uh, going on then, if we could uh, get to the next photo, Yes, I've chosen this picture uh, so as to contrast with a bad experience I had two years ago. And in this, uh, for this photo shoot, I worked with uh, a team which was a model and makeup artist and a stylist. And um, they helped me to work for my personal project. And um, uh, yes, it, it was very peculiar to work with a team because we have to work under pressure, we have to work fast, we have to um, to know all the parameters, we have to value the job of the, the work of the makeup artist, the model, the stylist. It was a lot of things to think about. And uh, yes, it's not the same as just working with nothing like just the landscape or an object and just working with a model, you know. Bob? Yes, uh, you know, it's a lovely photograph. I, I, I understand that there were some, you know, 
conflict, you know, as you go along with uh, with the other people that you work with. But that's you know part of being a professional. I I also understand that there was some sort of uh, uh, disagreement about the how Marina was going to be compensated for this work. Uh, you know, the promise of additional work was was part of the the conversation here, and and that may not have come to pass. So again, we go back to something that. Uh, Marina had on her um, uh, website, uh, right, Sim, that I, I pointed out to you early on. Uh, it said, um, uh, no free work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, um, we talk about the difference between a professional photographer and an amateur. A amateurs don't generally get paid for their work. And, and we had a, a, an expression uh, in our studio that was, no cash, no flash. So, you know, people get that Im impression. And that's a, a very important distinction between professionals and, and amateurs that you, uh, you know, you don't really, um, you, you don't accept free work unless it's for your own portfolio and for your own head kind of, you know, then those kind of photos can be taken without any monetary uh, compensation. But, uh, you know, the, the photo itself is beautiful, it's, you know, it, it, it it has again the shallow depth of field and and the expression from the the model, so it's uh, it's worth something. Let's take a look at Bob's photo. Yeah, uh, you know, we we don't do a lot of portraiture, but you know, this just kind of fell in, and 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 I think it you know tells enough of the story by itself. The you know the the hair and the expression on the face. Uh, this young woman was uh, uh, attempting to be a, a professional model and signing up with an agency. And I, I think she actually did quite well with it. Marina? Back to Marina. Sorry, yes. Uh, I've chosen this picture uh, to, to deliver the same idea as, um, as uh, was, was telling with the photo studio is that uh, the better we do different pictures, the better it is, because we have, uh, as being an artist, it's not easy to find work. So it's very important to, to try different things and to have a lot of things to present uh, in our book. So that's why I decided to try, um, to try product photography. And uh, yes, it, this one was my first try actually. And, um, Yes, because maybe one day someone will ask me this kind of picture, so I have to show him that, yes, I'm able to do this. Bob? Again, you know, the diversity here is, is very important. You know, we, we shot everything. We, we, we did product photography. We did aerial photography. Uh, we did um, motion pictures, still photography, you know, so all those things when, when one was going very well, the other might be slow. So, you know, you, you, that kind of diversity helps build a business. Uh, th as far as the photo itself goes, it, you know, it's wonderful that you're, you're, you're doing this kind of thing. There, there's a rule, uh, an unwritten rule, I guess, that says that when the shadow of an object becomes larger than the object itself, that sometimes can be distracting. So, you know, that would be one comment uh, to make here. I, Obviously, if it was a, a totally 100% uh, advertising photo, uh, I think the bottle would be full also. You know, maybe there's a little bit uh, of that that runs into the, to the uh, logo of the thing. But, you know, otherwise it's a great attempt and, and it looks like it just occurred, you know, like these bottles were on the shelf somewhere and all of a sudden the, the light came in through the window and, and you, you were able to kind of illuminate it. But, the light from behind really illuminates the color of the perfume, I guess is what it is. So uh, I don't really have a great example. The next photo is one that we took in the studio. Unfortunately, it's a terrible copy. So you, you, we can show it because I don't think the, the, the bad aspects of the copy detract from what I would be willing to say about this photo. So can we go to the next one and we'll, we'll have a, yes, right. You know. Again, this, this is a four by five transparency, which is how you know, most commercial work is done on a large format like that. Uh, but for me to show it to you, I, I had to hold it up in front of a lamp and take a picture. 
You know, so it, it, it's from that aspect of it, I apologize. But what it demonstrates is another style. What this, what we actually did here was behind the bottle, we uh, cut a white piece of cardboard or foam core, and we positioned it behind the bottle, not right up against the bottle, but an inch or two back. And we, you know, folded it, leaned it back so that the, the, the shoulders of the white card were the same as the bottle. And, and the lighting there illuminates, you know, what we see. If the, the reflection is one single overhead soft box. And, um, you know, just another technique for, you know, illuminating that kind of um, material as, as it goes. Uh huh. And the, 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 this is a similar situation on the white background. The the uh, the bottle itself is very beautiful. You know the way it's made and sculpted. The interesting thing about it is that the top actually comes off and becomes a glass. So it has a kind of unique feature to it. Um, they didn't sell very many of them because they couldn't ship them and keep them in one piece. Unfortunately, they they arrived in their locations broken more often than not. But otherwise, you know, it's just a nice, clean um, product bottle shot. Okay, next, please. Uh, yeah, th this is me too. Uh, I, I, again, you know, just controlling the light and the reflection. You know, we could have put that reflection on the left-hand side. We could have put it anywhere, and we could have had it in any shape we wanted. But we chose to kind of contour with the shape of the uh, guitar. And you know, slight angle of the guitar so that it shows the depth of uh, of what's there. Um, it's hanging on a, a monofilament wire from a, a bar across the top of it, so we kind of secured it at the bottom, and uh, it just it, it's a product you know shot in the studio with with lighting created entirely. Next, please. Marina? That's Marina. Yes, this picture was taken last year, uh, just one, one year ago, and um, it was in a, in a hotel in Lyon. And um, yes, uh, it, it, it was to, we, we had to value the, the hotel, it was for, um, uh, yes, it's for the hotel. and. Uh, it was very strange to work here because the light was very low and uh, I had to think about a lot of things at the same time. It wasn't easy, but um, yes, it was a good experience. And I, yes, I like this place, this bar. I think it was very beautiful. Bob? Yes, you know, the, it presents a lot of challenges when you have a low light situation like this, but. Believe me, you, you run into it more often than you would think. And, uh, you know, um, the first thought is the, the, the goal here is to have everything sharp from front to back. Uh, the, the first reaction when you get into a low light situation is to open up the iris of the lens completely and let as much light in as possible. But that defeats the purpose of having a, a long depth of field in the shot. So you're better off and Marina must have done that here, is to stop down the lens. Uh, every lens has a, a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. But if you're able to stop down the lens a little further, five, six, or eight, that's when you get the maximum depth of field out of this. And, and that's what this shot has. The, the bar stools in the foreground, all the way to the candelabra uh, are, are you know, in focus. And um, also when you stop down the lens, some of those pinpoint light sources um, tend to give you a little cross star effect or something, but they don't flare out like um, like they do, you know, if you were shooting this wide open. Um, it, it, it's great. It, it's, it's an alluring photograph. You want to get in there. You want to see what's going on. It has kind of a sepia tone to it. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a legitimate interior uh, sample of, of your work, Marina. It looks good. Let's take a look at Bob's work. Ah, yes. Very, very, very different environment. You know, this is uh, uh, actually at uh, renovation of a, a bar at Newark International Airport. And, you know, very, very different kind of thing. They, here they want to show the, the, the la large 
aspect of this and the colorful aspect of it. And, uh, you know, we didn't need to stop down too much. We, we, we didn't need to uh, be worried about the exposure because there's plenty of light here. And, uh, you know, just a, a, another interior sample. Next photo. Uh, yeah, this, this is mine as well. Um, again, I apologize. This is a copy, but um, you can kind of see that when you stop down, the, the pinpoint light sources tend to, you know, give you that kind of cross star effect. But again, uh, I apologize. The, the, the copy is, is not great. <laughs> okay. Next um, photo. Marina, can you tell us about this landscape? Yes. Here I wanted to create a mood with the, the clouds and it was kind of really enigmatic ambience. And um, yes, I like what, what happens with this tree in the middle. We don't know where we are. It, we're just lost as if a storm is coming. And um, yes, it was very peculiar and I wanted to capture that. Bob? Yeah, I, I love this photo. You know, the, the foreground still has enough exposure that you feel the grass or wherever you're standing. Uh, you know, the, the clouds are just dramatic and, and amazing. The tree in the middle just adds the, the, the little icing on the cake. And also the, the streak of, of light uh, to the left-hand side, the narrow strip there, it tells you maybe that uh, the sun is coming, you know, and that the storm is leaving. But it's just, you know, most landscapes are, are done in, in thirds, kind of the rule of thirds, but this is bang in the middle with that tree. And, and uh, it just, it really works out nicely. It's something that, you know, you, you, you could see putting on your wall. Let's take a look at Bob's photos. Um, oh, well, <laughs> it's, very different, very, very different. Uh, um, can we show the next one as well? Um, the color version of this? Yeah, you know, th th this was my aerial photography kind of uh, situation, but you take a, a, a color photo like this on a bright sunny day, and then, you know, with the pandemic and things, um, we can go back to the black and white. Um, these were photos in a, an online gallery. It was a fundraiser for my local union, 600 of the still photographers. Uh, we were asked to submit photos that weren't taken on the set that were our personal uh, favorites. And um, it was a fundraiser for out of work um, uh, members of our industry. But the, the black and white, is that, is that still there? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so now this becomes something that Natalia could speak to, you know, when when so much of an original photograph is being manipulated in such a way to make it black and white, we enhance the clouds a little bit. And, and you know, the whole idea of the pandemic uh, kind of hit home around this time. So, um, you know, th that, that aspect of it, that you take an original photograph and you manipulate it, how far can you go manipulating it and still have it be a photograph. Um, so that's... Fantastic, thank you. Let's uh, go on now, please, uh, to Natalia Mount. Natalia, tell us about Pro Arts Gallery and Commons, please. Pro Arts Gallery and Commons has been embedded in the, um, um, it's an art space that has been around in Oakland actually since 1974. Um, so it has a long tradition of supporting um, artists of all mediums um, through um, exhibiting their work, through different services we provide, and through um, basically supporting the development of, of and, and the, the development and the sustaining of an art scene here in Oakland uh, is very important, especially in these times. So. Um, to continue to uh, essentialize artists and creatives and, and the art spaces that, and, and art and culture in general. Uh, it's a way of communicating, which brings me to the point is that um, in respect to photography in the art world, um, and as a curator, I, I 
think of this uh, these photographs very, very differently, as you can imagine, because I pay very little attention to the um, technical machinations within the, the um, you know, the, um, the photograph. And I, I mostly would like to, uh, to know what is the concept behind it, what is the, what is the purpose of, uh, um, of taking these particular photographs, right? And again, coming back to the agency, of the artist, what is the intention? You know, a lot of the photographers that I've worked with, artists, um, have a uh, particular um, uh, interest um, that they explore throughout their career. Um, and we can think about people like Nan Golden and Sidney Sherman and all of these artists. Um, and we can see how it's more of a project based. Um, conceptual underpinning uh, for the work rather than, um, of course, taking photographs for a particular purpose, which is to, you know, to the portrait or commercial work is you, as an artist, you don't have the agency, right? Uh, you do what the client wants, right? Um, again, bringing back that into the art world, um, uh, um, again, the idea is to stay away from, um, from um, to say something else through your work and to have the agency to say it however you want to say it through photography, but less, um, but it's less about, again, the, um, the way you capture the images, but what story would you like to tell or, you know, and, and in this case scenario, I, I, um, I put a slide for an exhibition that we had at Prouds Gallery called the Berlin uh, Ears, the Wonderland Ears, which is uh, an exhibition that we, um, Berlin Wonderland, Wild Ears Revisited. So basically it's about the, uh, the, the Berlin Wall Fall. And I just wanted to, um, we talked about landscape and we talked about people and the capturing. And again, you can see the difference in the photography in this way that, it, it, um, that it's capturing moments that is documenting a moment, that is archiving a moment. And um, so photography is then used by the artist and by the public. The communication is different. The channel of uh, perception is different, right? And the way that is presented is different, right? Furthermore, it's very interesting we talk about that because um, actually exhibition photography is very important because as you can see it is um our space is very difficult to light the gallery so as you can see um actually it's really important to actually have great um exhibition photographers which i struggle with all the time and marina that might be something that you might want to explore because it's terribly hard to take um still photos of an exhibition or a photograph of a photograph as you as you can see a little bit here the photographs are not that great i mean of the exhibition but the work itself is amazing um as i said it does it does tell a story and it's very important often because it is the only story that sometimes remains through photographs and through that media in our consciousness and in our memories and and again um connecting that with political work and socially engaged work. Photography is really important um, in terms of telling a particular story, agitating, protesting, communicating, you know, of course, talking about journalism all day long <laughs> in terms of photography. But again, very much removed in an art context, you know, very different art journalism, very different than when it enters the gallery, because then it has to be about um, not only about the the photographer and the way you take the photograph, but it has to be about your subject more so and, and the feelings and the moods and the concept behind the whole story. Again, that's another that's example true. of a photograph. So Natalia, so it's it's like you said, it's this kind of marriage between content mm -hmm. and the way of presenting that content, uh, the social, political, artistic. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 again more about the ideas and the thoughts. The intention is different. You're not. Um, it, it is really about. It's really the work is driven by the artist. That's what I mean. Um, and it has, um, in this case, it has the ability to really transform itself. You know, by the time it gets to the gallery, and I work very closely as a curator with all the artists, so there there might be also a very different conversation in how to present it because of the uh, um, uh, space, because of the, the, the space, uh, the, the idea how it, those works would communicate directly to the audience and so forth and so on. This, the audience is very much different than the general audience when you do a product placement in an advertising 
um, um, magazine. So again, the communication and the relationship between an audience and artist is, is, is extremely different. It's not as controlled as, as, um, as when you, are, um, as you enter um, the studio, basically, right? It, it, it's, it's sort of like you have to tell the story with, um, with visual language, but also um, a lot of the times it's beyond that. It's really about the concept and the, and the, and the, and the ideas you'd like to communicate. So Natalia, so the first, uh, the Berlin Wall exhibit mm -hmm. you showed us, many of those photos seem like they could be, have been taken by any of us. This, uh, I can't remember what, the name of this. This is also, this is another exhibition that we had, and this is the there work of Paul and it's um, the, the new work normal. Oh, oh, you okay? So this is an exhibition that we had, and this is the work uh, of uh, Delphine Diallo, and she's actually a French artist, and uh, just in comparison. Um, this is no longer fashion photography in the professional world, right? C will be a professional, you know, perhaps fashion photography, right? When, again, when it enters the gallery, it becomes more about the subject, about the image, about, um, um, again, we are looking at color. We are looking at, at, at the way the subject is being presented in order to, um, to communicate the essence of the subject, right? But again, it's, um, um, you know, it, it, it has long tradition in art history photography about the subject and the observer and the gaze and <laughs> all of this. So I, again, it, it's really about the artist. Uh, it's really up to the artist to, um, to, to manifest the intentions through their work on view. And what stories they, they want to tell at this point. That's the, that's so the you know, a, curi a curiosity, yeah. Natalia, because uh, yeah. in your um, in an article about you, it talks about how you studied criminal justice and that you actually were not a trained artist yourself, but because of a, an, in an internship you did at a contemporary art museum in New York City that your uh, mentor, mm -hmm. she told you, you know, it's not about having a, a degree in art. So how is it that, what do you think about being an amateur or a professional and does that, how does that affect your work? Because actually you're judging, if I understand these professional artists. Well, actually I do have a degree in art. <laughs> I actually have two other degrees. Uh, my criminal justice background was my bachelor degree. Um, I do have a master's degree in art markets. And so I studied a lot of art history. So I'm in a position to not only curate, but also judge other artists. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I do that very much so all the time. But um, I also have an MBA in media management. And throughout those two courses, I augmented my own personal knowledge. And um, and I worked at PS1. And so um, this is the Contemporary Art Center that I started um, my career at. And um, and um, that was um, that was extremely. Um, it's really important as a curator or any professional in the art world to work with artists. And I worked with artists for a long, long time. And that personal relationship you develop and the way you start understanding the artist's point of view is where I personally feel now very um, very comfortable to comment or, or to critique anybody's work because. I, I've had these personal conversations with people and connections with people that I understand what is the intention of the artist when they present their work to me. So very much then uh, the opposite of what I was saying then. So it's actually, you would uh, you would recommend then that anybody who wants to go into curating yeah. art needs to have a, a rigorous academic background. I, I don't think there's a formula. I think, um, I mean, there's a lot of artist curators, let's not forget. So those, this is, I don't think there's a formula to be a curator. I think the best thing that I can suggest, uh, that I can advise is that um, to basically have the, um, because curator really is a facilitator and organizer of others' ideas, right? And the curator themselves have their, uh, 
ideas of how to present the work and what they want to say, but it has to be a constant. And if it is not a collaboration, then a curator cannot exist, right? It does not exist because the work is driven by the artists. So again, um, if I had the professional background or if I didn't, the most important thing is to be able to understand the artist's work and to be able to translate it in a way in which um, that collaborative process is obvious to the audience. That's why curators exist because they collaborate with the artists. Understood. So yeah. have there been times like Marina was telling us about where you've had difficulties working with artists? Every day, <laughs> every day. It's difficult because that relationship, navigating the relationship is very complicated because again, it has to do with the agency of the artist and it has to do with the agency of the curator. And often there are a lot of um, differences, but you must find a commonality. And usually that is that is done based on the fact that um, there, there's, some, there, there's, there's, there's an idea that uh, both the curator and the artist um, would like to communicate to an audience and there's an urgency to do so at that particular point so at the end everything works out great but i do really enjoy to engage with artists on um, long-term projects because that's where you develop the relationship and that's how you can actually um, create work uh, in a collaborative manner when you say long term you mean like this year and next year and like seasonally or uh, uh, more so develop relationships and, and, and continue to support these artists and work with them in different settings or variations. So again, have sort of like um, extended, um, oh, ex um, extended relationships so you can, uh, again, also um, follow their career and support them, you know, in that's a way. Good. Yeah. Okay, let's go on then. Okay, so this is another way to present photography and we talked about, you know, just different variations and channels of, of, of being a professional photography, a photographer yet entering the, the kind of like the context of the art world through, um, and we've been very successful during the pandemic again with our product. Prowards Commons Press, which um, this is an example for. This is um, uh, Molly Underwood did a um, uh, did a series of uh, took series of images uh, photographs of the new normal, basically the uh, photos during the pandemic, and um, and so we printed this zine through um, on a risograph printer, and so you can see back to Bob what he was talking about again. Um, um, if that was, um, that is completely up to the artist to manipulate the images the way they want to. And so in this case scenario, they come very kind of like different, but it's also a book, you know. So, um, uh, so again, as a photographer artist, you have uh, way more um, agency to experiment within your photography because you're not producing this for anyone else, but for yourself or and and the public in this case. So you can really control your ideas in the in the way you want to. Yeah, there's just another example of the same book, but you can see the image being um, altered again um, in uh, through the through the technicality of the printing on the risograph, which creates this really cool seventy style images. Another way. Um, of uh, presenting a uh, photographer, a uh, photography work is um, is this book that we did for Samuel Lurk is by Jose Vardy. And um, in this case scenario, we talked about um, the visual image, but um, the visual image um, it, uh, being um, embodying ideas. And, 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 um, uh, and in this case, um, Jose actually uh, writes poetry and he pairs the poetry with the visual image. So again, another way of, um, of break, like that is another kind of like, um, I suppose, a channel that Marina can explore with her work to, again, um, have some fun and not be, <laughs> not be completely beholden to, to, the, to the professional photography world. That's another, that's another image following that, yes. So again, landscape photography. Um, yeah. So yes. Wonderful. And so we included that picture because me and Bob were talking about, yes. So this is, uh, Bob, do you want to talk about that first? And in terms of experimentation and then the artist removing 
themselves from um, from the subject in terms of technicalities and having and having fun, I suppose, experimenting with this. Right, <laughs> it's all about fun at this point. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this is uh, uh, yeah uh, an installation. You know, a large art installation under the Brooklyn Bridge in New York City, and it was only up for about a month, I think. But uh, it just you know demonstrates how art can you know be enhanced by the photography or or you know shown to a larger audience perhaps you know than would be normally um i think one thing that that um we can stress and and that i know marina is uh is very well versed in this you know in terms of photography you 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 need to know the rules before you can bend them to your to your liking you know and i, I think that she's done a great job of that so far and you know that's uh that's i am not an art photographer you know i i i have to uh, deflect to you and and i i very much like your comments about you know what separates um you know the art and the photography and uh you know i, I wish i had more time to shoot landscape and uh, and the you know the hair on the bumblebee's ass on the flower you know those kind of things i wish i had more time to do that but you know there was always no cash no flash so uh, uh but really I, I i've enjoyed your comments yours too marina thank you and i was gonna thank say you. on the note, note he has um the no no was it no cash no flash that is also so in the art world i must um, i must advocate for that um because artists often don't get paid um so we're changing that here in open um i wrote an essay about reframing um the economy um through reframing art labor um but yeah so even if you're an artist photographer you should still very much um make sure that you get paid so that that part should remain very much um the same yeah so yeah, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't often but uh but we must be vigilant <laughs> right yes. right yeah yeah so i'd like to uh, ask each of you one final question then all the same question in uh academia today uh it, about uh, art criticism music criticism we talk about reception the reception of art uh, as opposed to how um, when, for instance, you think about Beethoven, everybody writing these stories about how what a hero he was. Now the focus today seems to be more on, well, how did people actually listen? What did they think about when they first heard the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? So my question to you is, let's start with Bob, please, and then Natalia, and then Marina. What does, what would you like that people take away from your photography or your art, what is it that the message that you would prefer that they get? Um, well, you know, I, I think that anytime a photograph can, you know, evoke some sort of uh, emotion, you know, um, in, in my days watching films being made, it, it, uh, the director that I worked a lot with, Jonathan Demi, uh, directed Silence of the Lambs and, and won an Oscar for that. His comment was always, if you can make people laugh and cry at the same time or in the same, you know, situation, then then you, you've run the gamut. Then you you have, you know, evoked emotion from both sides of, of what you do. So, you know, that's kind of uh, how I would approach things and, and how I would like to be remembered maybe as, as being able to, you know, capture the, the 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 essence of of what i'm photographing uh, I, again I, i'm not an art photographer so maybe i'm not the best person to answer that question sim Thank okay you. Uh, uh, so. uh, natalia please um what i would like for people to <laughs> to consider, especially um, at the moment because of the pandemic and everything else and, and the way that the arts now are, are, go are going um, more, more so online than, um, than actually um, in terms of relational, in terms of public uh, gatherings, in terms of being together in the same space. I would like to, for people to really think about how essential and how important art and culture are in our environment, in our society. And I would like people to know that the artists are those catalysts that empower the community and that um, and that are, that are the 
that are the forefront of our of, of everything from <laughs> um and I, I i just really would like people to um reroute their understanding of art these days and just be more flexible perhaps i'm very interested in the expanded field of art there's there's so much conversation about what art is um and so maybe we can move on towards um a new reality for all of us and and be um a little bit more supportive and understanding of of, of creative in general and 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 start perhaps drawing less rigid lines between professional and unprofessional and um and just hybridize the, the the arts experiences this way for for the public marina yes what i wanted to say is kind of same idea it was that in fact art is open to everyone and we can create with nothing we can create with everything art is everything and nothing we, we saw that with uh, Marcel Duchamp, with his ready-made, he, he told us that yes, this can be art. And in fact, no one can judge um, if this is right or not right. It is everyone can create something if maybe with message, but even if there's no nothing to, to deliver, just we can, it's, it's open to everyone and also, we we have to work we have to practice a lot a lot if we want to to do better of course but there's no rules in art and it's what it is wonderful because it's different from mathematics or languages that it's that yes it, it starts to create something and um yes try new things wonderful so let's take a look at how we can stay in touch with Marina. We have her Instagram website here. There it is. We can't see it very, very well. There it is. Much better photography. Do not shoot for free. I think I read it at the top. And uh, so Marina, people can get in touch with you through this website. Yes, you can contact me in DM or there's also my email because uh, yes, it's the only way actually for this time to see my work because my my website isn't ready yet. But um, yes, you can contact me by sending me a message, a private message or uh, an email. I, I think I also put my phone number, but I'm not sure about that. So um, yes. Fantastic, wonderful. So that is Instagram dot com slash marina dot lenick and let's take a look at natalia mount's website this is a pro arts gallery and commons there it is so natalia how can people contact you um they can contact me through the website i have an email link i believe um and, and so it would be under residence and um uh, pro arts sorry we have a particular box there and they can um they can contact me this way or uh, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram and they can, um, yes, or they can call, um, they can call Pro Arts. <laughs> Fantastic. So the website is proartscommons.org. So thank you very much, Marina. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you very much, Bob. Let's take a look at next week on next Wednesday, December 9th, our Senti Haritonov, Expressions of Musical Elegance. Back in July, the Kudyev brothers, Eldar, Emil, and Farhad shared with us their improbable journey from Turkmenistan's Central School of Music to the top echelons of the classical music industry in the United States. No two musicians are alike, and Arsenti Haritonov will share with us his own unique directions for how to get to Carnegie Hall. Arsenti started studying piano at age 16, and within three years, he was performing as soloist with Russia's most prestigious orchestras. A few years later, as a relatively unknown musician in the United States, he was invited to give his debut recital at New York City's premier classical music hall. A published review of the concert probably speaks for the popular sentiment that evening. Quote, it was surprising to find the house filled to capacity, but when the artist began to play, the reason was clear. 
By the way, Arsenti is also a prolific composer and has written music to accompany not only figure skating competitions, but also drone flights. Come welcome Arsenti Haritonov to, to our show and find out what his next three-year plan is. So that's next Wednesday, Arsenti Haritonov, Expressions of Musical Elegance. So we are, unfortunately, our conversation was way too short for uh, such three such lovely guests. And we look forward to having the next conversation with you very, very soon. Uh, Bob will uh, be back in March for sure. And I'm hoping also that Natalia Marina will be willing to come to his show so that they can uh, take apart his photos and show their own. So in the meantime, before we see each other again, thank you very much to Marina, to Bob, to Natalia, to Professor Lino Rivera, Professor Niels Moots, to our superhero production team, and most of all, of course, to you, our participants, without whom none of this would be worthwhile. From Vienna, Austria, from Lyon, France, from New York City, the Bay and the Bay Area, California, goodbye and see you next week. Merci.